as we worship our Creator this morning. Church, what's going on? Happy Sunday. So glad you're here. If you're tuning in online, welcome in the room. Some good energy. Uh, If it's your first time, especially glad you were here. Last week was Easter, so we all came into this place and we had a great Sunday. Maybe you were one of those individuals in the room and you said, you know what? I need to get back into church. If that is you, glad you were here. It's not lost on us and it's a privilege that you would spend this time, this hour with us today. Last week was Easter and it was the big celebration, but what do we do now, right? What do we do now? We continue. We continue to celebrate. We continue to celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive and that that there is hope in our lives and in this world. And we continue to live as Easter people on a regular basis. That's who we are at Bridgepoint Church. Our mission is helping people get closer to God. And in these worship experiences, everything we do That is our aim. That is our goal. So let's keep the celebration going. Let's keep the excitement going. 
If it is your first time, come see us in the atrium after the service. Let us know online. We'll connect with you and tell you how God is on the move at Bridgepoint. But right now, as we continue in this time of worship, turn to somebody around you, introduce yourself, say what's up, but let's keep the worship going. Church, let's continue worshiping Jesus and inviting the Holy Spirit into this place, into our hearts. He's here, so let's sing to him. The Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come
eyes on Jesus. Just keep your attention on him right now.
Jesus, we love you. We glorify your name. You are the reason we are here this morning. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. Lord, thank you for being here with us. Let us cling to these promises, Father. I pray that they would become more and more real to each of us every single day, and that you would just uh, supply us with the faith, Father, to believe in these promises. Thank you that you are here with us, Lord. Would you continue to move and speak this morning? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I can still distinctly remember some of those moments. And then you've had some of those too. I'm confident of it where you're just saying, man, I just want to figure out what God's plan is for my life. Or maybe if you're not sure of this faith thing, I, I just want to make the right decision for my life. Uh, I, I want to know what, 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 what's my next step? Where should I go off to college? I remember that as a high school student that I was just saying, God, in light of all that you're doing in my life, where do you want me to go to college? And praise God, he sent me to the good place, the land flowing with milk and honey known as Auburn University. And I didn't go where the other bad people go to college. I, I went to the good spot. And then I can remember after college where I felt like I was receiving this call on my life of God saying, hey, I want you to go into ministry. And so I hung that call up every time. Like, God must be calling the wrong number. Like, he must be mixing up his wires. I don't know that that's really what God's doing. And yet it still felt like that was part of it. I want you to go into ministry. It's like, well, what does that mean? Uh, I'll, go to, I'll go to school for that. So I started saying, God, where do you want me to go to seminary, preacher school? How do, you, well, how do I know where you're calling me? And I ended up in New Orleans for preacher, preacher school, working on my master's degree for three and a half years. And so it was coming out of seminary that it was just like, okay, God, but what, what's next? Like now I'm, I'm running, I have zero, I don't love school anyway. That's just, I'm not wired for that. What's the next move here? Because the only thing I can see on the horizon is like having to get into the the real world and find like a real world job, what's next? And so I had literally only one job offer after seminary. And I was like, thank you, God, you made that very clear. I'll take it. And it was an interim student ministry job working with middle school and high school students in Kentucky that months after I arrived, the interim became permanent and got to spend five years in Lexington uh, serving middle school and high school students. Thank you, God, for that kind of clarity. And then, I mean, you've wrestled with some of these decisions too. God, what's the next job? What's the next step? What's the move in this relationship? I've obviously all my life had to fight women off, like, give me space, like, I just want God's best for me. I need to know the wisdom for that. And so then I found one in Lexington, and I'm kidding about that, wherever she's, I'm, the moment she hears this, I know she's going to roll her eyes, and I will hear about it later. Because in actuality, what happened is like, well, I found one, I got to move really quick and get married. Yeah, I don't want to let this one go. So I love you, Tiffany. I'm glad that you're stuck with me. And then I'll, I will never forget the moment that Bridgepoint's founding pastor and I had a conversation on the phone where it's just like, God, is this, are you doing something here? Are you about to move us? So we were married for about a year, maybe two years at this time, and just really felt like God might be stirring something in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County. And so I, I won't forget the moments that we, Tiffany and I are praying like, God, would you just help us understand what you want for us? And so Bridgepoint brings us down for a week of interviews and, and they put us on a hotel in Treasure Island where the balcony of our hotel room faces the beach. And we had just got in and we were going in there to put our stuff down and we step out there and Tiffany says, this is where God's calling us. <laughs> and I was like, hold on. Like we haven't even hardly had a conversation. There's so, but we were like, we're not gonna live on this balcony. Uh, we gotta know more about this stuff, what God's doing in this church. And so 
hearing the stories about how he was working and, and still is through Bridgepoint and the way he's taken my giftedness and calling and positioned me for a time like this, we, we knew that it was clear. And you, you've had those moments, right? You, you, God, is it this job? Is it that job? Do I make this investment or do I save more? Is this the relationship that's best for me and for the other person? Uh, you know, all, all of those things, like what is God's will? By will, I mean like his, his plans and his purposes for my life and yours. What is God's will? And so I just wanna give a big shout out to everybody downtown, Seminole, online, here at the Tyrone campus. I'm so glad that you're all here. We're kicking off a brand new series today called Know God's Will that we wanna begin a journey of, of having prayed with many of you and, and walked alongside many of you. We know that one of the things that regularly is a part of following Jesus is just this desire to say, I, I wanna figure out how to know that I'm walking in God's plan, God's will for my life. And if you haven't got there yet, there's gonna be a moment that you'll get there after having done one service already. So many of our folks are in this season where we just wanna be faithful, right? Like we just wanna be where God wants us to be. And this series is gonna be super helpful. So I need you to commit right now. If you can't be in service, make sure you're joining on the online campus, but be here because I think this is gonna be so practical and so helpful. And here's why I say that. Here's why I think this is going to be a very meaningful series for you, whether you're in the decision-making moments, trying to discern, understand God's will, or you're not, because if you're not, you will be at some point in the not-too-distant future. Uh, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament before Jesus had lived, died, and rose that talked about what it would be like to know God, to be on a journey of getting closer to him and see your faith growing, and to know God's will. It's kind of almost like the theme verse of this series. It's Isaiah. Again, this is a prophecy of what it would be like. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 said, whether you turn, he would be talking to us, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And what if God's desire in the grand scheme of things is not to be like a distant, kind of aloof, far off God that's just kicked back in his recliner saying, okay, I created, created it all, now they can figure it out. But if Easter teaches us anything, it, it must be that one of the things that's in God's nature is to be near, to be personal and to want to be with us. And what if his desire is not to be so mysterious to you and I? That yes, there's aspects of an almighty God that I hope we never fully understand because he's God and quite frankly, we're very much not God, but I bet you knew that, right? But, but what if his desire is to be so in tune with our lives and, and for us to be so in tune with his work in, in the world and in our lives that there's almost a sense of our day-to-day -day life, of, of our decision-making processes, our navigation of life in this broken world where we know that he's not only with us, but he has such a plan for us that he wants to guide us, that he wants to lead us to a purpose, to his will for our lives that finally becomes something that satisfies that becomes something that fulfills us, where we don't have to look for love and acceptance and, and try to find meaning outside of ourselves, but instead on a journey with God that we can be so near to him that we almost hear him, probably not audibly because I've never heard the audible voice of God, but deep down inside these impressions or, or, or these, these moments where you just feel like God is speaking saying, this is the way, walk in it. Wouldn't that matter in your faith journey? Because I know that it would make a difference in mine. I've had those moments, you have too. And I think that's why this series, just commit to be here. I think it's gonna matter that much. But today to kick this thing off, I actually need to pull all the way back to take just a 40,000 foot view of the idea of God's will. All right, this is God's will for you and for me. And, and really, if it's a God that holds the whole world in his hands, then what is his will for the whole world? Like, what, what is he up to? What's, what's, his, what's his end goal? What's his motivations? What is he aiming at? And so maybe before we get so specific into helping it apply it to us as individuals, let me peel back and jump off from this question. What is God's will? Well, what is he doing? And what comes to your mind when you hear that question? What, what is God's will? What are his plans? And by will, that's what we mean. What are his plans, his purposes, his desires? Why did, it, why did he uniquely shape you? 
Why did he gift me with some things, but also make some things weaknesses for me? And why did he do it opposite for some of you? What's he, what's he up to? How's he working? And how does it apply for my life and yours? I want to start there because in a conversation of being able to discern or understand God's plans for our lives, we have to take a big picture approach to make sure we're understanding him well. And so I, I want to go to a, a, what I think is an incredibly familiar passage, whether you've been in church for a long, long time, or this is your very first Sunday, and you're just a little bit skeptical or critical of church things. You've probably heard this, but I hope today this lands in a refreshingly new way for, your, for you, because we're going back to old faithful. We're going back to the familiar. This is one of Jesus's best friends that's recording a conversation of Jesus's teaching. So he's, he's kind of writing down what he heard Jesus say to him. And what Jesus said is, is the part that you probably already know, but try to see it totally fresh with me today. This is John chapter 3, 16. John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world. I, I, can I just let that land maybe fresh for you, maybe, maybe like very familiar to you, but God so loved, God so loved. The overwhelming aim, the bent, his motivation, his desires, what he, what he created all of creation for and from was love. God so loved the world. And we know this, like we, we know this, but do we live that? Is that really something that's inside of us that, that shapes us and, and helps to form us and guide us and lead us? God so loved. Because a lot of times what happens, it's like, oh yeah, I know, I know John 3, 16. Yeah, yeah, I, I got that one. Or it's like, yeah, God so loved the world that it's almost so big and so grand that, that, that we miss us and we miss our, our, our part of that story, that you could actually substitute the words, the world for your name. God so loved you, me. God so loved us that the nature and story of telling the things of God, and maybe you've heard this before too, a lot of churches refer to this and all that Jesus has done as the gospel, which literally translates as good news. Does, does the reality that God so loved you, is that good news? What is God's will? And, 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 and how do we figure it out for our lives? Well, it has to begin with this. God so loved, so loved. He emphasized it. This is Jesus talking. God in human flesh about his father in heaven and his purpose on earth. God so loved the world, so loved you and me, that God the father gave his only son that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the good news. Can I ask you something? Is that good news for you? Because I think one of two things often happens for those of us that have been around the church for a little while is one, this becomes such a recorded statement in our mind. Yeah, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Woohoo! That it, it just, it's, it's, it's just so normal that we miss it. Or, or in our experiences with God or experiences with other churches or other teachers, or maybe even God forbid me, that there's something about the reality of this that if we're completely honest, the story of God, God is not good news to us. It's just a story. Is it good news to you? that God so loved you. Do you hear that? Loved you. God so loved you. That's good news about what he's doing in the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And it, the, John continues what Jesus was saying. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Listen, these are Jesus's words, not a preacher's words. Hear it directly from him because I think some of us sometimes confuse that. God didn't send Jesus to condemn. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. God so loved you. God didn't come to condemn you. And so for anyone in this room that has over the course of time, based on a religiosity version of Christianity, that you have for a long time felt not worthy, that you've been told that you don't measure up, that your sins are disqualifying, that you're not good enough, that because of where you've been or what you've done, somehow you're outside, you gotta perform a little bit better next time. For anybody sitting in the room bearing the weight of recognizing that we are broken and in need of rescue, that we do have a sin problem that's wreaking havoc havoc on our souls and our opportunity to know God that deeply, but instead of finding freedom in Jesus, we feel like we show up to church and, and for whatever reason, we're putting on this weight that suddenly like, I don't deserve to be here or I'm worried I'm gonna internally combust at any moment because God, I like the sound that God so loves loves me. But in reality, when I think about God, all I'm concerned about is, is God, does God just so hate me? Is God wanting to condemn me? Is God in heaven saying shame on me? God so loved the world and he didn't send Jesus so that you and I would find us, ourselves confronted with the reality that we are broken and sinful. You didn't need me to tell you that. That we find ourselves living in a broken, sinful world. And instead of discovering freedom in him, there's an enemy that's causing us to say, that sounds really good, but it doesn't apply to you. You've been told all your life, you're not good enough. Your parents made you feel devalued and like you could never earn or be satisfied in their love. That your workplace isn't doing it anymore that you've done enough things with enough people, with enough money in enough different ways that you're like, I don't know where to find that longing of acceptance and that deep desire to be loved. Listen, God didn't send Jesus so that you'd sit here saying, oh man, I'm not worthy. God sent Jesus so in the overwhelming nature of how broken we are, we could find hope because God so loved you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only son of God. So it's like Jesus or bust, yes, and here's why. Here's what condemns us. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The Bible says the wages of sin, what we've earned for our sin is death, separation from the goodness of God forever. But what does it is the fact that we look back at Easter 2,000 years ago and light came. Hope was made available. But how many of us walk out of the, the church services and head right, right back to the things that are creating darkness in us? Trying to figure it out or find it out in our own way, on our own terms, and according to our own plans for our lives. But that's not God's will. God's will is God so loved. You understand that you are so loved, so loved that the father sent his son to die, that you were worth the life of God because of his depth of love for you and his desire that you would live. That's what's true. A.W. Tozer, he's a, a Christian thinker of days gone by, and, and he he puts things this way, and I think this is really imperative in order to discover God's will for our lives collectively. A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So can I pause here? What comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you think about God? Is he a grumpy old man just looking to judge and condemn? Is he looking down on you after the 17th or the 7th or the 70th time of the same stuck pattern saying they can't get it right, they just need to deal with it? Shame on them. I can't believe they'd act that way. 
But suddenly what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing because if God is love, then when you think about God, I hope what's flooding your heart and your soul in this moment is a reminder of the depths of God's love for people like me and you. You are loved. You are deeply loved. You you are loved so greatly that someone went to death in your place and mine, not so that they could hold all the cards and invoke shame upon us, but to rid us of that condemnation and offer us life, life that was birthed out of love. Discovering God's will is not discovering what God made us to be so that we could be his robots and accomplish his purposes. Discovering God's will means when you recognize how loved you are with God, it gives us an opportunity to live loved. And from living the love of God, we get to love other people. And when life is defined based off of, rooted in, and foundationally built upon the love of God, then suddenly we're so satisfied by his love that we don't have to go search for it in other places that we were never meant to find what our souls are longing for. You are so loved. Is the story of God good news to you? Is it good news when the relationship is hard? Is it good news when you're grieving? Is it good news when you don't wanna be at school and when you dread heading back to the workplace? Is it good news when you look at your bank account? Is it good news when you think about your relationships? Because if the story of God in all facets of life is not good news, then we're not understanding the right story or the right God. Because the love of God changes everything, which brings me to an incredibly important point about discovering, discerning, understanding God's will and purposes and plans for us is this. God's will for your life will be linked to his will for the world that you will not have a purpose in your life that isn't flowing from his love for the world that he holds in his hands. Here's here's how this applies. Everything about the way you were made was to be able to know the love of God and enjoy the love of God forever and find a satisfaction that flows from your love relationship, your friendship with the God of the universe that pales in comparison to every other relationship and every other purpose this world could ever offer to you. Your will, God's will for your life will be linked to his will for the world. And what is God's will? God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that you and I might live now and forever. To to understand the love of God, to be loved and be changed by the love of God and live in and live by the love of God and our love for him. But can I share a word of caution? And again, we're just getting this series going. There's so much more to this. I can't wait to unpack with you. But but can I share a word of caution with you? That from a pastor who has a concerned heart about the nature of which you and I go about our day-to-day lives and the nature about where we find what God wants us to do or what God wants for us or how to understand in the decision-making moments of our life, what is his best for our lives? I want to give you a caution that that it's a caution that I need for myself too. And it links all the way back to the story of the resurrection. It was the same exact thing that happened back then that often happens for us. Can I go there really quickly? There's these two ladies that were returning to Jesus's tomb. We talked about this last week. They were finally going to be able to treat the body of Jesus. He had a really rushed burial. So they were going back to treat his body and and they encountered an angel that said, hey, he's not here anymore. He rose. You know a little bit of this story. If not, you can go back and catch up last week. I want to take you to Luke chapter 24, verses five through seven of these ladies that were going back to the tomb and what they encountered. Because I think there was something that happened there that needs to be something that matters to us today. Here's what it is. And as those ladies, they were frightened and they bowed their faces to the ground. The men, the angels, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Isn't that an interesting question? Because for them, they weren't seeking the living. They laid that dead body in the tomb. They were going back to where they put it. Dead bodies don't often move from where you place them. 
so I've heard. The angel is saying, why are you seeking the living in a graveyard? And the angel continues for them, for these two ladies. This had to be shocking, almost disorienting. The angel said to them, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? Remember Jesus said he was gonna go through this? Remember he said he would die, but that he would rise from the grave? That's the context of the world you and I live in, the historical realities, they took place. But the question those two ladies encountered is a question that I think you and I need to process and give a little more credit to in our lives than we often do. You remember the first thing the angel said to them? Why do you look for the living among the dead? And and here's what I think said from a, a pastor's heart that cares about each of us finding God's will for our lives we won't find his will. We won't find life in him in dead places. But that's where we too often go to search for it. Let me, let me ask you this way. Are you looking for life in dead places? Are you looking for satisfaction from a relationship that you know is outside God's best for you? Are you looking for a satisfaction in your workplace that will never be enough no matter how much you keep going? Are you looking for satisfaction in a dollar amount that once you get to that dollar amount, then you will have arrived when in reality, once you hit that dollar amount, it'll just be a little bit more that you need? Are you looking to find satisfaction, blessing life in your relationship with someone else, but you're operating in that relationship outside of the bounds that is God's best for you? Are you cutting corners? Are you trampling other people? Or do you have a whatever it takes, whoever I have to hurt to achieve what what I want for my life? Is Because if you're looking for God's best, you won't find it in dead spaces. Because oftentimes what we find in dead spaces are things that resemble death. That's why when we've been trying to build our lives on our own and it never satisfies us is because we're building it apart from the foundation of God's love. That's why when we're on to the next relationship, because the last one ended up just like the other ones did too, it's because we're searching and trying to treat those relationships outside of the bounds of God's desires for us. That we're going to screens in our living room to find some sort of satisfaction from other people, though we're really just using them to satisfy our own urges. That we're turning to bank accounts thinking we can go and buy something that we're longing for. And then when we, once we get it, we're just left with the guilt and buyer's remorse. That we're, we're spinning our wheels trying to figure out why are we longing? Why are we searching? Why can't I find acceptance? Why don't I feel like I belong anywhere? And it's because we're searching to fill that void from dead places. But why? Why are we looking for the living among the dead? Is there anything in your life that you know is outside the bounds of God? Because what happens is we said, God, would you please bless X, Y, or Z in my life? And God is saying, I can't bless something that's damaging your soul. I can't bless something that's pushing you further away from me. I can't bless something that's creating more self-reliance in you. Why are we looking for life among the dead? God's will will be tied to his overall will, and God won't send you into dead places to experience it. God instead calls you out of dead places to give you a transformed life. That's the difference. And that's been the story of God. That's been the story of God from the very beginning. Throw back really quickly. I'm almost done. This is Deuteronomy. It's from the, from the get-go. Uh, Moses talking to the people of God long before Jesus ever lived. And Moses said, and now Israel, the people of God, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord, to, to love him and respect him so deeply. Fear the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Love him. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's not a command like, this is how I want to control you. This is how I want you to discover life. And here's why Moses said that. Here's the next thing. He said, to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I'm commanding you today for your good. 
If Moses was saying from the get-go, guys, what does God want for you? He wants you to discover his good plan for you. And his good plan for you is gonna flow from his overwhelming love for you. Throughout history, God has been working to communicate his love for the world. And yet throughout history, God's people have been trying to find it and create it on our own. Fast forward to after Jesus's death and resurrection. John also wrote this in 1 John chapter 3, 16 through 18. By this, we know love. Here's how we know it, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? that if your purpose is allowing you or I to produce selfishness and not love other people, then we're probably missing it. And here's why. This next verse, John like gathers everybody in saying, hey, listen, focus on this. All everybody in, little children, hey, listen, 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 listen. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. That purpose, action, deeds that we do as a part of our life, that will be rooted in love. I think there's far too many of us that would love to cry out to God and say, God, what is your will for my life? And God is saying, stop going back to dead places to find life and instead understand how deeply loved you are and live from love. But is that what you do? Is that what I do? Because again, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Is the good news of Jesus really good news? Because when it comes to your purpose, when it comes to my searching, my longing, when it comes to the void that so many of us wrestle with on the inside, looking for ways to complete it or fill it or satisfy it, trying harder, creating it on our own, having enough, doing enough, trying to act and be enough, that's never been the heartbeat because God's will for your life will be linked to his will for the world. So to begin this conversation, and this is where we're gonna pause it for today, but we have to begin here. God so loved you. God so loved you. God so loved you. You don't have to go back to that relationship. You don't have to go back to that bottle. You don't have to go back to that place. You don't have to go back to that party. You don't have to go back to that ideology. You don't have to go back to that stuff. Why? God so loved you. He's not waiting for you to earn it. He's not waiting for you to figure it out. God so loved you. He's not measuring you against anybody else. He's not waiting for you to pull it together. He's not waiting for you to navigate the condemnation that you felt or you feel God so loved you to understand what he's doing in your life. You must understand that it begins with a God, an almighty God that loved you, me, in our sin, in our brokenness. And in the midst of our sin and brokenness, he died to offer us life, a life of meaning, purpose, and hope. But it has to start there. What is God's will? God's will is that you and I know how deeply loved we are and live from that love. And if you're searching to satisfy that, if you're trying to find love anywhere else, you're trying to be enough, be accepted, to belong anywhere else, it's gonna leave you empty because that's not where love is. Why do we look for the living among the dead? I want you to know God's will, to know God personally. And that's what this journey begins. And we'll pick it up right here next week. Would you pray with me? 
God, I wanna pause for this moment in the middle of this, the beginning of this series and begin with the opportunity for us to do a little bit of introspection. What comes to our minds when we think of you? God, would you help some of us that have a wrong understanding of you to know you more? God, would you help some of us that have heard somewhere along the way that you're just incredibly disappointed or disgusted with us to understand your love? Would you help some of us to understand how life-changing it is that you first loved us? And God, would you help some of us to begin to step into a life of purpose that begins with understanding that you, God, love us just as we are. And from that love begins a transformation that changes us from the inside out. And God, would you begin that work right now in Jesus name. Amen. Do you know how loved you are? Do you? Do you know how loved you are when we so often seek it in the wrong spaces and places? How loved we are when we try to base it on performance or try to measure it? How loved we are when we try to compete and keep up? do better than him or keep ahead of her. You know how loved you are when you've absolutely blown it? You know how loved you are when it's, when it's messed up, when it feels hopeless? You know how loved you are when you're the reason things broke or feel like they're breaking? God so loved you. And here's the good news. It's never too late to begin to step into God's purposes because we can't out God's ability to love us back into his forgiveness. God so loved you. But to understand his plans and purposes for your life, we gotta understand what we think about when we think about him. So can I share this with some of you? Because I know for some of you that this is the regular temptation is to tune in or sit in the room or hear John 3.16 over and over and then we'll walk right back out or we'll disconnect from online and we'll go right back to looking and searching and building and seeking life from dead places. But that's still not gonna be enough. It never will and we know that. But I go back to them and I know that oftentimes you are too. You are so loved. Stop trying to clean yourself up. Stop trying to figure it all out. Stop trying to put the pieces together. Stop trying to break your own chains as if we were strong enough to do that. Stop all the efforts today and just be loved. You are so loved. If you're here today and you don't know it, that you don't know God's love, you've never heard it, you're struggling to believe it, or there's a lot of voices in it from the enemy saying, yeah, but that doesn't mean you. I would love for you to take a step towards prayer and care today because you don't have to walk back out seeking it in dead places again. We have a space called prayer and care where online you just click a button in the room, you go out the balcony, out the doors to the right and down the stairs, main floor, just out the, out the doors of space called prayer and care where our team doesn't want to do anything bizarre with you. They just want to hear from you. You sit at a coffee shop style table. Nobody else hears your story and you just get to tell this person, would you pray with me? I want to know God's love. I've never known God's love. Would you pray with me? Because I feel condemned. I feel too messed up, too far gone, too broken. I feel like I've ruined it. I feel like there's no hope. But when God loves you, there's always hope and you are so loved. Please don't leave today questioning God's love for you. For the rest of us, if prayer and care isn't our response, then maybe where the response is to worship, to worship that God brings us back to life from the dead things we often are defined by. He he breaks the chains of addictions. He repairs and restores the relationship. He provides for us. He cares for us. He knows us. He satisfies us and he has plans for our lives and he's bringing us back to life. And maybe the response is just to worship how good God is and how great his love is for us. 
I don't know what your next step is, but please don't miss this moment. Please don't walk out too soon when God is evidently at work. Please be present in the presence of a living God whose spirit is right here with you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I don't know what your response is, but you do business with God as we stand and respond to him together. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. Forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life Where there was dead religion Now there is living faith Oh 